morning and welcome to Living Waters uh, Living Room Worship. We are back uh, in our living rooms. We're thankful that you have uh, decided to join us from your living room. Uh, if I could think of one quick upside to live stream worship is no one has to wear a mask. So we can be thankful uh, and belt it out. for that. Yes, and you can sing all you want. You can sit as close to whoever you're with as you want. Um, you can't cancel Christmas, and yes, we're in lockdown, but we can continue to worship God from the comfort of our own homes, and we can continue to celebrate uh, the birth of Jesus, God's greatest gift to us uh, in His Son. And uh, we have placed on our website the uh, liturgy, if you'd like to follow along, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, it's also available on the Facebook page, uh, just a few uh, posts down. So we're going to begin this morning with our opening song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Continue with the Christmas acclamation. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The colic for purity, pray together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, Christ have, have mercy, mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Call it for the first Sunday after Christmas. Almighty God, you have poured upon us the new light of your incarnate word. Grant that this light, kindled in our hearts, may shine forth in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy 
Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, and I'd be happy to read it for us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him. Yet, the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Now let's pray. Father, we pray now for the ministry of Christ, the light of the world, that he would shine into our darkness, and that the darkness would not understand, comprehend, overcome him, but that his light would be life to us all. Give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ, as your holy word is proclaimed. Hear us, meet with us, and deal with us by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So our reading this morning that Kathy just read from the Gospel of John, the opening prologue of the Gospel of John, presents us with a very different image of Jesus' nativity. An image that's far from the rustic scene described by Luke with shepherds, angels, barn animals, and the Holy Family. I want you to imagine for a moment that the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are great pieces of classical music. So we might say that the Gospels of Matthew and Luke begin with themes that have the quality of a lullaby. They recount the nativity, the incarnation, the birth and infancy of Jesus. Mark's Gospel, on the other hand, begins with a fanfare with the trumpet blast. It's the heraldic ministry of John the Baptist announcing the coming of the Messiah. John's gospel, however, begins with neither a lullaby nor with trumpets, but rather with a soaring choral anthem. It begins at the pinnacle of praise. It doesn't tell us about the birth of Jesus, neither does it talk about the ministry of John the Baptist. John plunges with us into the ocean depths of mystery, talking to us about the unity of the triune God and, and the two natures, divine and human, that subsist in the person of Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. John starts with, the most profound of statements, as though to make absolutely sure that whatever else we think about the birth of Jesus as we contemplate his coming at Christmas time, we get this much that Jesus Christ is a man like no other. And holy awe, stunned and reverent before the mystery of the God man, ought to mark every one of our responses to him. Otherwise, we might be tempted to dismiss his birth as irrelevant. 
I mean, after all, what could be more run-of-the-mill? There's nothing weaker, nothing more mundane than the birth of yet another baby, especially a peasant child born in impoverished circumstances 2,000 years ago. Or perhaps we might assimilate the story of the coming of Christ into a larger narrative marked by simple Christmas sentimentality. A story about a baby in a manger to go along with the tinsel and the twinkling lights. However, as we stare into the rude cattle trough where the Christ child was laid, John is telling us in his prologue that we have in fact come to the edge of the abyss, to the brink of indescribable glory, to mystery and majesty made flesh. John's poetic words about the word made flesh dwelling among us is steeped in the language of Greek philosophy and early Christian theology and interprets for us what we see when we look into the manger. They are arguably the most profound and beautiful statement of Christ's person and work ever written. They give us a sense of what Jesus' birth in Bethlehem that first Christmas looked like from heaven's perspective and provide a deeper understanding of who the babe in the manger is and the true meaning of Christmas. So this morning, I want to look at three things that John tells us about Jesus, the Word made flesh. Three things. So number one, John tells us Jesus is the divine word. The divine word. Verses 1 to 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now there are three things that we need to know about Jesus' divinity in these opening <laughs> verses. Number one, Jesus is, Jesus the Word is eternal. Jesus the Word is eternal. Notice the verb tense that John uses in verse 1. In the beginning was the word, not is the word. In other words, when the beginning began, the word already, always was. Let me say that again. When the beginning began, the word already, always was. If you have your Bibles open, look down to verse 14 for a moment and notice the contrast. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. His existence was a given when all other things came into being. And then in verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. At the dawn of creation, the Word already existed. But in the middle of that creation's history, in the middle of that creation's story, the word that had already always been became that which had never been. The word became flesh. He took into union with himself a human nature in the person of Jesus. When the virgin conceived of the Holy Spirit, and bore a son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, that was the beginning of the baby, but not the beginning of the Word. The pre-existent Word became flesh. I mean, just think about the magnitude of that for a minute. Before Mary herself ever drew her first breath, the Word who became flesh whom she bore and brought into the world, already, always was, and filled the universe with his glory. When the clock first began to tick, the word had already lived for an eternity. You see, the word isn't a creature like us, bound by time or nature to a beginning and to an ending. The word was already in the beginning. Now, in the early church, there was a heretic named Arius who denied the divinity and the eternal nature of Christ. He expressed this belief this way. There was when he was not. 
there was when he was not. In other words, there was a time when Jesus the Word didn't exist eternally. For Arius and for modern day people who still hold this belief, such as Jehovah's Witnesses, Jesus is a mere creature like us. But that's not what John says here. John is very clear here. There can be no misunderstanding. At the beginning of creation, when the Lord God started the clock on all matter and all energy and set the planets spinning on their axes, the word already always was. Jesus, the word, is eternal. <clears throat> Next, in these first verses, we're told Jesus, the word, is identical to God. Jesus, the word, is identical to God. Now, you've probably noticed that in verse 1, John is giving a nod to Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. However, here John says, in the beginning was the word. In other words, the God who presided over creation, John tells us, is the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, the word was with God, and the word was God. So, what is John saying here? He's saying, the only God there is, is the same God as the word. All that God is, the word is. The being that God is, is the same being the word is. So the, the one who took flesh and dwelt among us that first Christmas is indeed the maker and sustainer of all. Now, the Apostle Paul puts it this way in Colossians 1, 15 to 17. This is what he says about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And Paul is clear here. Jesus is the perfect revelation of who God is. If we want to know what God is like, we need only to look to Jesus. Jesus and God are one. The baby we worship at Christmas is, is not a mere infant, but the creator of the universe. Paul says all things were created through him and for him. The only God who is took flesh and nursed at Mary's breast and made his home in Nazareth and sat by the well in Samaria in John 4, parched and weary. The God who preceded creation and who fills all things in every way walked the dusty streets of Galilee. The one who slept exhausted on the boat that night amidst the storm as the waves crashed over their tiny vessel and the disciples quaked in fear was the great I Am, the God himself. Or as one poet so wonderfully puts it, who is he in yonder stall at whose feet the shepherds fall? Tis the Lord, a wondrous story, Tis the Lord, the King of glory. At his feet we humbly fall. Crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Jesus, the Word, is identical to God. Number three, the third thing we learn from these first verses, Jesus, the Word, is distinct from God. He's distinct from God. Again, verse one reads, The Word was with God. In the original Greek, this is literally translated, the word is toward God. The Father and the Son, each turn towards the other in the infinite, endless exchange of love that characterizes the fellowship of the Trinity. The Father delighting in his Son, the Son in the Father, and the Spirit in the Father and the Son. 
Everything the Father is, John tells us, the Word is. And yet, the Son is not the Father. As Jesus says in John 10.30, I and my Father are one. And yet, they are not identical. They are distinct. And yet, indivisible. Right? There, is one but, there is but one God, yet there are three persons. God the Father... God the Word, whom John calls in verse 14, the Son, and Jesus Christ in verse 17. And as John will go on to say, there's God the Holy Spirit. Not three gods, one God. Not one person, three persons. Dwelling forever and the indissoluble bonds of love and relationship and fellowship and communion. Friends, when we come to the manger and gaze at the Christ child, we're not just staring into the eyes of a newborn baby, but into indescribable mystery. And so faced with this spiritual reality, how should we respond? Well, I think it's easy. We have been hardwired for glory. We have been hardwired for glory for beauty and for awe. We were made for wonder. This is John's purpose as he gently leads us into the mysteries of the Trinity and the union of divinity and humanity in the person of Jesus. He wants to show us ultimate beauty, ultimate mystery, ultimate glory. That we might bow down in holy awe and give ourselves in complete adoration and praise. What do we do when we come to the Christ child, to the eternal divine word? We prostrate ourselves before him in surrender, submission, and praise. John wants us to know that Jesus is the divine word. Number two, John tells us Jesus is the creative word. The creative word. Verse 3. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that has been made. Now this too, if you think about it, is a reference to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. However, John fills in some of the details of that story for us. He flushes us out. Here is the one by whom God spoke all things into being. The divine word, the eternal son, the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. According to John, Jesus is the mediator and the agent of creation. His fingerprints and the record of his mind are imprinted upon all the things that he has made. One person puts it this way. This means that the creative force... The source of every other form of energy isn't random, impersonal, blind, capricious, or malevolent, but Christ-like. The creation expresses him and in itself contains no unchrist-likeness at all. In that confidence, we harness creation's resources, assured that all of them are good. And we move over every horizon, expecting to find not black holes of sterility or absurdity, but coherent and fertile expressions of the mind of Christ. Basically, he's saying, it is the work of Jesus and the mind of Christ displayed everywhere we look in all that's beautiful and bright. And glorious. This means that the world around us isn't wicked or bad in itself. And matter, the stuff of the world, isn't to be despised, but rather to be studied as a window into the beauty, majesty, and wisdom of the Lord God and His Son Jesus. The coming of Jesus that we celebrate at Christmas isn't offered to us to be a distraction from the bleak midwinter. It's not the spiritual equivalent of a Christmas tree 
something to bring a little cheer into our gloom or to distract us from the brokenness of the world. John is telling us in his prologue that the coming of Jesus at Christmas is to remind us of God's creative work by his Son and to teach us of his great love for the world. To teach us that in order to redeem the world, to rescue it from its warped and broken state as a result of sin, God would himself, in the person of Jesus Christ, become a creature. That he might redeem this fallen world and one day bring a new heaven and a new earth into existence. Think about it this way. Every time we appreciate the beauty of creation, every time we enjoy a beautiful sunset, or are awed by the changing colors of fall, or swim in a sun-kissed sea, we experience the creative power of Jesus, the Word made flesh. And we are reminded of God's great love for us and for the world. John is telling us that Jesus is the creative Word. And finally, number three, John tells us that Jesus is the illuminating word. The illuminating word. Verses 4 to 5 reads, In him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus came, the point of his mission was to bring illumination and light and understanding. We see this later in verse 18. John says, No one has ever seen God, but the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, who has made him known. This is what Jesus does. He is the revelation, the word, the self-communication of God to you. This is why Christianity is a logos, or word-centered faith. We are word people, because Jesus is the word. Notice John doesn't write, in the beginning was an event, or in the beginning was an action, or a deed. Right? Something did happen that first Christmas. However, events, actions, and deeds require interpretation. Right? They're unclear modes of communication. John is telling us that when God sought to reach, to seek, and to save the lost, to call out to us and to bring us to himself, he did it in a crystal clear, sharp, precise communication. He sent his son to make the Father known. This means that our Christmas devotion is threadbare if it is not saturated, steeped, shaped, and directed by Holy Scripture. A mere sentimental nod in the direction of Jesus will not suffice. Jesus is the Word. And he calls for us to be people of the Word. Our response to Christ's first coming, our, our celebration of Christmas, needs to include the Bible. It needs to include a renewed commitment to becoming people of the book. Right? John tells us that Jesus is the illuminating word. Now we all know the Christmas story so well. However, for those who pause and gaze into the manger, for those who take the time to ponder the awesome reality of the word made flesh, the true meaning of Christmas is clear. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3, puts it this way. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory, the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. Christmas celebrates the mystery of the incarnation, which means in the flesh. 
in Jesus, the babe in Bethlehem, the invisible, all-powerful, pre-existent God, the second person of the Trinity, the creator of the heavens and the earth, became visible and touchable. The awesome glory of God became resident in a person. And God's entire plan for the salvation of the world was wrapped up in a helpless infant. Jesus, our Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, the Word made flesh, is God's invitation. It's an invitation to us that says, you wouldn't come to me, so I'll come to you. I'll live as one of you, I'll eat as one of you, sleep as one of you, even die as one of you. Will you see? Will you believe and receive my love? If you think about it, God's sending of his son, Jesus, is a measure. It's a measure of the commitment of the heart of God to reach you. Here are the lengths to which God would go to bring you back to himself. He'd send his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. To bear your sin, to obey where you could never hope to obey and then die the death that you deserve to purchase for you full, free forgiveness. God's call to you and the measure of his desire to win you and make you his is nothing less than his son Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and reigning. The question is, as God speaks to you in the person of Jesus, the Word made flesh this Christmas, are you listening? Will you answer His call and come with renewed devotion and bend your knee to the Christ? For He is the divine Word, and the creative Word, and the Word who brings the light of life. Let's pray. Loving Father, we bless you for the gift of your Son, Jesus, the Word made flesh. As we celebrate once again his birth this Christmas season, we pray that your Holy Spirit would fix our hearts on him. As we gaze yet again into the manger, bring us to the brink to stand in holy awe at the vast, divine immensity of the God-man. And for all that he's done for us in his birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension, and in anticipation of his return. Faced with the reality of your great love for us, O God, may we in turn offer ourselves, our souls and bodies, as a reasonable, and holy sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue uh, this morning by responding to the sermon uh, with the Apostles' Creed. And I invite you to say this statement of faith with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join us as uh, we sing the song, Sweet Little Jesus Boy. We continue uh, with a time of prayer. We're using uh, a prayer or a litany uh, for the incarnation. And so when I say, for your indescribable gift, the response is, we praise you, O Lord. So as we offer our prayers to God, please respond to the invitation for your indescribable gift with the words, we praise mm -hmm. you, O Lord. O God, the ruler of ages eternal, you are without beginning or end, yet you chose to be born an infant in time. For your indescribable gift, we praise you, O Lord. O God, the invisible, you are the one whom nobody has seen or can see, yet you assume the face of the Son of Mary. For your indescribable gift, we, we praise you, O oh God. O oh God, the all-powerful, you hold the mountains in the palm of your hand. Yet you let yourself be wrapped in swaddling cloths. For your indescribable gift, we, we praise you, O oh Lord. O oh God, the eternal glory. Innumerable angels acclaim you endlessly. Yet you chose to be rocked to sleep by the songs of the daughter of David. For your indescribable gift, 
we praise you, O Lord. O God, the universal provider, you feed every creature with their daily bread. Yet you chose to hunger for the milk of your mother. For your indescribable gift, we praise you, O Lord. O God, the infinite, heaven and earth cannot contain you. Yet you rest in the arms of Mary. For your indescribable gift, we, we praise you, O Lord. O God, the perfect joy, you are the source of the happiness of heaven and earth. Yet you cry like a little child. For your indescribable gift, we, we praise, praise you, you, O Lord. O God, the eternal word, you are the light of all created intelligence. Yet you are laid in a manger and cannot even speak. For your indescribable gift, we, we praise, praise you, O Lord. Lord. O God, who by the birth of your Son in the stable of Bethlehem, made highest heaven stoop to lowest earth, Give us grace so to ponder in our hearts this great and mighty wonder that we may respond with gladness to your unspeakable gift and be raised at last from earth to heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And let us now humbly confess our sins to Almighty God, first in silence and then confessing together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now, since we are not able to share Holy Communion uh, with each other while in lockdown, um, I invite you to pray with me the prayer for spiritual communion, um, asking Jesus to enter our hearts and our lives afresh today by his Holy Spirit. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I ask you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you, together with all your faithful people gathered around every communion table of your church and in every home. And I embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated from you, for I pray in your holy name. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, you may have noticed last night I tried to send you a, uh, a video clip from one of our missions partners, the Pinarosas, uh, but for some reason that link didn't work. So I've been given a new link and I will send that out this afternoon. So you might want to watch that. Uh, I'll also send in that email a link to this service on our YouTube page. 
Um, so if you've heard of anyone who's had trouble accessing the live stream on Facebook, they could watch it after the fact uh, on YouTube. Uh, we are praying for you in this time of lockdown. Uh, I encourage you to use it as an opportunity to press into God and to listen to what God has to say to you uh, in this season. Uh, with all of the distractions taken away from us, uh, perhaps we can focus on Him uh, more clearly uh, than we could before. Um, as we build up to uh, the new year, um, uh, I'm sure that you're all thankful, like I am, that 2020 is almost over. Uh, and I just pray that uh, um, all the riches of God's blessing for you and your family uh, in 2021. And so indeed, the next time we will see you uh, will be uh, after New Year's. So I pray that you have a safe uh, and happy uh, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Let's pray. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be amongst you and remain with you, with those whom you love and serve, this day and always. Amen. Amen. Our closing song this morning is Joy to the World. serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Thanks, friends. Have a great Have week. Have a great one, everyone. Love you.